you have found your way to the Agency Cloud Adoption 2020 Assessment Panel, which is an all-star cast, I will just say. And, and a mass, such a big panel, they had to bring in more risers. It's like, from me to Oki, it's like almost a day and a half. <laughs> Sound travels, we'll get down to the end of the panel by the time we do it. I'm Dave Wondergren, I'm your moderator today. Thank you for being a part of it. We're gonna talk about what's going on with cloud in the federal market, what's it look like for the year ahead, and longer term than that. But of course, these kinds of conversations are always better when you're engaged. So I have a few, uh, I have a few questions I'm going to tee up to get the conversation going. But, uh, but, but your participation will make the difference. It's, it's only 45 minutes, and there's like 26 people on stage. So you know, dive in, and otherwise, we'll talk our way through a lot of stories, and your time will run out. So get your questions ready, and we'll get going with you. The world is changing at a frenetic pace is just absolutely incredible to see the pace of technology change and the promise of technology. And as you look at federal agencies, you know, the twin pillars of the imperative for IT modernization and improved cybersecurity are just driving so much rapid change in the marketplace. And whereas in maybe years ago, sometimes it was like the comfort and ability and, and readiness and willingness and, and, and availability of new technologies that drove the pace of change, now we just have such an onslaught of how technologies are changing the way we live, work, and play that that is no longer the limiting factor. I mean, as you look at the IT modernization agenda, there's a big push for cloud. And there's been a lot of progress made on that front, and we'll talk about that progress. And, and we'll talk about the challenges that still exist and where we're going from there. But, but that's just the beginning, because the IT modernization challenge is all about not only do you need to move your infrastructure into the cloud, but you need to be thinking about all those legacy systems you have and how they interact in a cloud environment, and which ones of those should you retire, and which ones should you replace, and which ones should you refresh. And cybersecurity models, which have to be thought about completely differently in a cloud environment than in the old days of network enclaves. And then the issues of people, and how the workforce of the future will have to do different things, and, and engage in a world of everything from cloud as a service to AI, and what that means as a difference. And so those are some of the things that we're gonna cover, but we're really interested in hearing from you. So without further ado, since we do have a cast of thousands of, of stellar individuals up here sharing the stage with me today, let's go ahead and get ourselves started. <coughs> so we'll start with my next door neighbor. Gary Barlett is the CIO for the Office of the Inspector General of the US Postal Service. And prior to his current assignment, he had an august career in the Air Force as a cybersecurity operations officer, where he worked for, amongst other places, the Air Force CIO and the Air National Guard CIO. And so I'm going to start off with like the introductory question, give each of our panelists a chance to sort of stretch their legs. And it's going to be around, what's the state of the federal cloud market look like to you? And what's a success that you're seeing that's worth highlighting? And so we'll start with Gary, and then I'll introduce each of our fellow panelists. And by the time we get down the row, we'll be ready to talk about what's ahead. So over to you, Gary. Welcome. Thank you. So I think uh, right now the, the, the word is exciting, right? So when you look at uh, the environment that's available from a federal perspective, the capabilities that are available from a federal perspective, it's very exciting. Uh, we have in our agency about two and a half years ago is when we started our cloud journey. Uh, and I'm, I'm happy to say I'm reporting out to our executives in December that uh, we're, we're declaring ourselves migrated. Uh, but it's been an interesting, uh, an interesting couple of years. Uh, and the most exciting part is just all of the things, all the ca new capabilities that are available to us that we would never have been able to take advantage of had we continued down the old way of doing business. Uh, especially when you talk about accessing things like artificial intelligence. That's gonna be something I think is gonna be a huge game, game changer. We are a, uh, a federal law enforcement agency where I work uh, and the application of artificial intelligence to catching the bad guy uh, has our, our uh, investigators very excited and has my IT professionals very excited. So I think the, the, the biggest word I can use is it's an exciting time to, to be a CIO right now. It is an exciting time. Uh, times of change are times of opportunity. And, and you know, there is no slowdown in the pace of what our expectations are because of the way we live our lives at home. And, uh, and what I'm willing to do with this mobile device in my pocket, pocket is how I expect to be able to live my life at work. And that introduces some conundrums. And, and you've had a great career as a cybersecurity leader as well as your current position. And so what are you thinking about in terms of cybersecurity and the differences in the models and risk approaches that have to go into dealing with the cloud. So the, the, the realm of cybersecurity is interesting. You know, first of all, you gotta retrain your cybersecurity staff to understand that, like you mentioned, Dave, that it's not the way of old, right? It's an ent entirely new way of looking at cybersecurity. And part of that is when you go to the cloud, you have to trust 
trust but verify with your cloud partners, right? Because you are relying so much on your cloud partners to provide so much more of that security stack that you used to be completely responsible for. So working through that dynamic and training your, your, new, your uh, new CISO staff to understand that they are not going to be in control, absolute control of every aspect of the security model that they used to be. Uh, and really understanding that there's got to be that partnership with industry that you're going to have to rely on them and expecting the industry is going to protect you as much as you would protect yourself. I, I think some of these issues about giving up personal control will just are so foundational to this topic. And, uh, you know, and I'll say, you know, I'm chuckling at Alfred Rivera, who I'll introduce you in a minute. He and I shared a pass at the Department of Defense, you know. And years ago, if I had been at this panel with you, I would have said, we're happy to be in the cloud as long as none of you are there with us, you know, because, but, right, but, the, and, but these issues about relying on others and being part of a bigger trust environment are changes that are fundamental. And so, and so thank you, Gary. With that, we are going to move on to our next panelist, Adam Clater. Adam is the chief architect of Red Hat's North American public sector. He works with government and industry leaders to promote and define the use of enterprise open source solutions. Prior to joining Red Hat, Adam had a number of leadership positions in both government and industry. And uh, welcome, Adam. It's great to have you here. Maybe you could share with us a few thoughts about how you see the current federal market and what's the success that you're seeing that we ought to rally around. Yeah, thanks. It's good to be here. Um, thanks for having me. So, you know, I think very often when people start thinking about, especially in a context like this, we start thinking about cloud, our first thought is really towards infrastructure as a service because as IT practitioners, we've all been really focused on that stack of information technology within our data center and how we get it sort of out. Uh, but I think for our business partners and for CIOs and others, they really start thinking about cloud from the perspective of what is the line of business that I'm trying to service? How do I answer that bell? And then how do I get that capability out of my data center into someone else's to get rid of that management aspect that you were talking about, that really long tail of O&M that can be pretty overwhelming. And so for a lot of our customers, they began that journey years and years ago, right? We talk about email as a service and you know, at Red Hat, we use uh, like Google Docs, and I know people use O365, and there's a million other options for that. And a lot of those decisions were made five, 10 years ago. So for a lot of your customers, they've been in cloud, and they've had these cloud partners for a while. They've been selectively picking up those pieces of their business and moving them out. Infrastructure is probably the last 80%, right? Those 20% that were pretty easy to pick up and sort of toss out have already been done. But the problem that our customers are going to find is, you know, those software as a service providers predominantly that they've been using are not really compelled to integrate well with one another, right? They're not really compelled to integrate well with, with the things that may have to stay back in your data center. Law enforcement may not be able to put everything in someone else's data center. So the challenge I think that we have to really help our partners in government address is how do we manage that integration? How do we manage that data that we want to put out into the cloud uh, in a safe and secure way while continuing to focus not on, I'd like to buy some more disks from a cloud provider, but I'd like to provide this uh, capability to my line of business. It's, it's a great point. I'm so glad you brought up the infrastructure as a service is really almost like the table stakes. It is, it's game, really. Right? And, and while granted, you know, organizations that have like ancient gear that's no longer supported by the manufacturer software, no longer updated, right? The, I mean, those are huge problems, both in terms of being digital and cyber issues. But, but I mean, just moving your infrastructure to the cloud may not be the big money changer for you. And so if you were, if you were gonna help the audience think about like, what else should they be thinking about besides their infrastructure, what would you point them to first? Well, I think the analysis that I would do in any cloud migration is, what is my O&M spend on this activity today? And what will my O&M spend be on this activity in the cloud? And if I can't really quantify what that delta is going to be, we all understand I'm going to spend less on servers. OK, I'm not making that upfront hardware. But what is the actual O&M tail going to be of moving this activity into the cloud as opposed to where I am today? And so you really need to be able to understand and quantify that, as well as being able to say, when I move this out, how do I move it to the next cloud provider and not be sort of in the business of creating cloud technical debt? I think that's where a lot of people are today, is they're just moving something out, which is great. If you've got a lease coming up that you've got to move out of your data center, or you've got uh, servers coming off of lease and infrastructure makes sense, like those are great reasons to move to the cloud. They may not be cost-saving reasons to move to the cloud. So understand what you're actually getting into from an O&M perspective as you move into the cloud, and then I think you're doing cloud intelligently. Excellent, thank you. All right, next up. <laughs> Tom, yes. Tom Beach is the uh, Chief Data Strategist for the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office, where he founded the Digital Service and Big Data Initiative. 
to unleash the value of patent and trademark data through data science, machine learning, and applied artificial intelligence. He serves as both an evangelist and a technologist driving USPTO's data strategy, data lake, and open data platforms. Welcome to the panel. Thank you. Over to you, Tom. What are, what are some things, the successes that you're seeing in the federal cloud market that you're excited about? Yeah, so the, uh, thank you for the introduction, and it's great to be along uh, a, a great panel. So. For us, we really looked at, um, we, we are, like many other agencies, uh, rot filled with legacy systems, and one of our biggest challenges is, um, uh, to, to point out, is sort of, when you take something out and try to move it, the tentacles are not well known. And our ability to move any portion of any significant amount of our infrastructure out of our, our data center is, is very much a surgical challenge, right? And so, we're a fee-funded agency. We basically run in four time zones. We have four regional offices. We get 600,000 patent applications a year. We issue 300,000 a year. We got 13,000 employees. Uh, so the SLAs, the service level agreements, are, are very, very fast. Um, for our examination and mission-focused work, we need you know flip rates through documents. We need to be accessing things at a rate that's extremely high. So for us, one of the um, areas of opportunity has been able to take a look at sort of an API gateway. So when we rolled out the BDR, the Big Data Reservoir, uh, we figured out a way to, you know, in, in a temporal state, extract and operationalize the data that was locked up in these legacy systems, throw it in a lake, throw it up on a cloud service and put an API on it. And that really served us in both ways. We actually serve internally that way for our public data and then for our public consumption on data mining. Um, that's our, our, our approach that's been highly successful in certain pockets. Now to do that across an enterprise has been a, has been a bit of a challenge. Um, we are the US PTO, so that's patent trademarks, and there's 12 support divisions. Uh, corp, um, and so the challenge is really you know, wrapping our arms around the mission work and then all the support work that goes along with it that may not rise to the level of this is you know, gonna bring in fees. So how do we ensure that these folks are also getting the, the capability and the approaches? And so um, I think you asked the question about what's a recent win. You know, one of the more recent um, uh, activities in procurement we were able to, to, to do recently was really get a, a cloud provider um, partnership where it came with sort of best in class on the AI front. And it really, it really gives us a shot in the arm of understanding how do we create these lightweight methods of you know, you know, getting these AI sort of app stores that are on a cloud that are being provided by a provider as a value add. We want ready access to that. You know, do we want to be in the business of, of care and feeding of AI experts? You know, so we, we have a lot of smart people, but you know, for government to keep pace with the private sector, you kind of have to balance the challenge of like, who's more competitive? Is it better to buy it as a service or is it better to build it inside? And so we, we, we vacillate between the two. But, Excellent. But, you know. We're going to come back to that because I, I think that's a really important topic as people think through, like, what are the ways that you actually derive benefit? Because if you don't do it right, you could just find a different provider and not have the world be a And you have place. the unintended. You don't know how much it costs until you get the bill. Yeah. So yeah. when we look at the transactional rates and the, the cybersecurity element you mentioned about, you know, it's, it, well, it's, if it's encrypted in transportation or if it's there, it's for FedRAMP, it's not FedRAMP here. So you know, I don't, that's the problem. You end up parsing out your workflow based on what you can and cannot do based on your private data. Yeah. And that just becomes a whole yeah, another situation. But it's well, great, it's an exciting time. Yeah, well, it, it is. And I'll say data is all the rage, you know. If IT modernization <laughs> was the big topic last year, and goal one of the president's management agenda, data is like the big talk of the here. Economist Magazine a few years ago said the number one sexy job in America was data scientists. And, uh, yes. and it's all around us. And so could you just say a few more words about how the cloud activities that you're embarking mm -hmm. on are improving the data work that you're trying to get done? Wow, that's a great question. So um, I had the, the privilege to work on um, the uh, PMA on data as an asset for uh, OSTP and OMB last year on data governance. So I was the working lead on, on data governance. Um, and so that um, really, and we created the uh, federal data strategy for those, um, strategy.gov plug, um, and uh, there's year two. And so for us in terms of our organization, getting a, f a federal data strategy and understanding what that meant really unlocked the opportunities in the workflow. And what does that mean? It started basically with really understanding what is our data. 
you know, what we often do is kind of run around and kind of go, well, we're going to get this piece and that piece. We literally took some time and said, we sit on the largest repository of innovation and in R&D data writ large. That's the data that we have, bar none. So understanding how that's created, how we have it, and how do we treat it like an asset then gives us the sort of vision, okay, if I treat it like an asset, I properly secure it. I make sure it goes through this workflow. You know, I follow all the legal uh, ramifications that go on um, by making sure that we do things properly. So all that to say, we've taken a holistic look, a look in understanding a data strategy, and that's really been an element that even just today, um, our executive leadership, and that's an interesting thing in an organization, is to see your business unit le leads in an organization that are not IT standing in a room saying the phrase, data is an asset. Like you said, we finally arrived. Amen. I, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. That's the sign of culture change for wonderful, me. Wonderful. Wonderful. Our next panelist is uh, Alfred Rivera. It is a moment of personal privilege, I would just say. I love all my panelists. They're all outstanding 18 players, but uh, <laughs> I've had the privilege of knowing Alfred and working with him for many, many years. He is a true IT thought leader in a wide range of disciplines from cloud to cyber to enterprise services, and, and I just know you will enjoy hearing from him as much as I've enjoyed working with him. He's currently a principal for Breakwater Solutions, a uh, long-time career as a senior executive in the Department of Defense, most recently as the director for the Development and Business Center, the Defense Information Systems Agency. Welcome, Alfred. It's great to be working with you again, even if only for 45 minutes. Right. And I wonder if you'd like to share some thoughts about successes you're seeing. Well, I think that, you know, bottom line from a success perspective, I think that, like Dave said earlier, you know, we, him and I were at the Department of Defense when we loved clouds as long as it was just in our own cloud and nobody else can see it and touch it and all that stuff. We've evolved away from that. We've evolved to the point where we're accepting a lot of solutions out there. You know, one of the most exciting things I think from the department, can you hear me? No. Hey, Mike. My mic's not on. It's coming. All right, there you go. You're there. I think you're there. No, hello? Can you hear me? No. Oh, man. Broadway projection. You hate when that happens. Okay, I'll talk loud. How's that? Oh, look, they're bringing you a hand mic. You know, it's, a, it's an on-the-fly team here. All right. DevOps. Now you can <laughs> drop the mic when you're dead. It's hard to do with a lavalier. Yeah. Right. Can you hear me? Oh, yes. great. So, um, like I said, I, I was uh, in the department when uh, we, uh, we accepted cloud, but it was as long as it was within our own domain and nobody else can see it and touch it and all that stuff. And so we've evolved considerably here. Mm -hmm. We've evolved across the spectrum of infrastructure as a service and uh, uh, software as a service. And so I've been excited because I've been doing a lot of that stuff when I was in the department working with Dave uh, in some of the fieldings that I did, including things like MailCloud 2.0, which was one of my first big awards in terms of cloud on-prem. But it's been more than that. It's been an evolution of accepting the risk and putting things out where we felt uncomfortable for a long time and, and moving forward with that. Um, I think the latest things in, from a success story is even from the Department of Defense's CIO office, the idea of the acceptance of multifunctional clouds out there. The idea that not, there's not only a single cloud out there, but there are idea, there's, a, there's a, a, um, an evolution of accepting different solutions to support cloud. Like uh, Adam was talking about, some software uh, uh, SaaS solutions out there that meet functional requirements that are necessary. I think some of the evolutionary things that are going on right now uh, with some of our customers in the department, like Defense and Logistics Agency, in looking at blockchain as a cloud solution to support some of their ledger issues and their logistics issues is exciting new work and and I'm glad to see that um, they're not feel they don't feel that there's barriers associated with some of the security challenges we have mm -hmm. and are looking forward to doing those kind of new technologies and, and evolutionary efforts yeah fabulous you you worked in I'll say some of the biggest environments in the world and then and that scale presents an interesting interesting conundrum are, do you think there's some unique requirements that that folks need to consider as they're thinking about i'll say implementing cloud at industrial strength mm -hmm. yeah i think you know i was one who filled as one of the first uh, uh uh, called uh, software as a service when we fielded the single defense enterprise email solution one of the biggest challenges we had at the enterprise level was not only just the architectural associations with putting a single L, uh, active directory across the United, the whole globe 
but it was also satisfying that, that disadvantaged user, that user that expects to see a, um, a capability that they would see at their own home, but when you're deployed in a tactical environment with a very uh, dis uh, disadvantaged uh, network capability, but still see that same functionality and still see have the same capabilities of, associated with that. So that's the challenge that I think the department has when we talk about cloud, and we think that everything automatically can fit up there, but you gotta look at those requirements that that customer, that warfighter is looking for all the way down to that disadvantaged, uh, to that disadvantaged user who doesn't have the necessary you know, uh, uh, backbone behind him that will give him the, requirement, the requirements that a cloud uh, could uh, obviously provide. Excellent, thank you. And last, but certainly not least, half a football field away from me, down at the other end of our August panel, is Oki Mech. And Oki is the senior advisor to the HHS CIO. And he's also served as the CTO of HHS's acquisition division. He's been a big champion for the use of emerging technologies to include blockchain. Welcome, Oki. I hear you're doing you. double duty today. We can do a shout out for your second panel. You've got another panel coming up later this afternoon. Yes. But uh, if you want to share with us some successes you're currently seeing, that would be great. Yes, so uh, th thanks for having me. Uh, I want to thank all the sponsors as well for having us. Um, so when we think about cloud, we didn't really think about technology at first. Uh, you have to think about the mission of the agency as well as the business. Technology is in support of the business. I always say that there's no such thing as IT project. There's a business project with IT components. Uh, so technology wasn't a thought. We were thinking about legislation as well, such as MG, uh, M PMA, as well as uh, MGA, uh, MGT, as well as you know Data Act, uh, record management. You all since we're in the government, we have to consider all the, um, all the legislations and policy as well. So we, we, cloud strategy is one of our priority areas in, uh, in OCIO. Uh, Jose Arriata is uh, the CIO now in HSS, and we have four priority areas that we're looking into in terms of uh, OCIO and how do we deliver services. One is service delivery. Uh, second is cybersecurity, which is my background. Uh, second, uh, third is a cloud strategy. And then fourth, it's just modernizing, looking at new uh, technology and sunsetting old technologies. Uh, in terms of cloud strategy, I think, uh, I think there's an opportunity to not to move to the cloud smartly, but also to innovate at the same time, to look at your data sets, uh, focusing on data and to kind of get not only sunset old technologies, but also looking at uh, eliminating some of the double work. There's a, HSS is so large, there's a lot of uh, systems that are doing the same things. Uh, when you start doing, like we, we did Accelerate, we started data mapping, we, you know, we realized that you know, we could condense or even have one data lake that's, you know, right now there's 100 systems, but you could actually have one data lake and actually support the, the function of acquisition from A to Z. So that's, that's an opportunity to modernize. I think we have a good opportunity to do that, not just to go to cloud, but go, go to cloud smartly. Does it, does it align with the mission? Does it solve an issue you're trying to solve? Does it follow federal legislations, regulations? All that, all that has to be considered when you move to the cloud. Uh, technology is not that important, to be honest with you. Uh, the challenges on innovation is not about technology anyway. 20% of the challenges is technology. 80% of it is really the culture, the people, some of the stuff that you have to go through to, to get from point A to point B, so. Amen, and we're, we're gonna come back to that because I mean, it's so much more about the people and the process, mm -hmm. culture set of issues than just the technology. But, but I find oftentimes that if you ride the wave of change, you know, you can make more progress than if you're trying to battle the culture Right, like the fact that people want to be able to live their work life like they do Uber, Waze, you know, Zillow, name your app of choice, right, is, is like helpful. And so do you find, because I know you've been a champion for some new technologies, do you feel like the cloud work that you're doing is helping to accelerate like the appetite to do blockchain and, and other things like that? Yes, yeah, so we get, engage the, uh, the workforce regularly uh, through our agile, DevOps. Uh, process, we do, we basically said, hey, you know, workforce, you guys are gonna build the acquisition system for HSS. We're just gonna facilitate the build. So basically, we go out to a human-centered de design process and sit down with them. I mean, we have the, the FAR, the Federal Acquisition Regulation Requirements. I mean, we don't, I mean, but it's not about 
it's not about getting the requirements, really. It's really trying to get buy-in from the workforce and getting them engaged and getting people to collaborate and exchange ideas. And, and also, but there's an aligning agenda around human-centered design is really to get buy-in, really. Without, without buy-in, with innovation doesn't exist without adoption. If your workforce is not gonna support the initiative or buy into the initiative, you have, you have nothing. It doesn't really matter what you build. You could build the, the greatest thing ever, but if you don't get adoption, there's no innovation. In, innovation doesn't come from technology. It's really come from the process and the business. So that's why humans and design yeah. is very critical in what we do. We always engage the folks that are gonna be using the system. I, I love that point. Uh, uh, you know, we had our ACT IAC membership meeting yesterday, and our guest speaker was Bill James, who does DevOps at the Department of Veterans Affairs. And his his pitch was all about empathetic DevOps, and, uh, which I thought was like a fabulous term if you think about it for a moment about the the power of engaging human centered design with customer involvement. And uh, and so it was it was a powerful message, and, and I think it's one we got to keep an eye on because otherwise it's just like you know eat the widget, and is the widget really helping get the outcome? For the mission that we need, so we're going to we're going to shift our attention now because you're all here to think about like what's going to go forward, and so uh, so you know it, as as I said, riding the waves of change always makes it a little bit easier, and so you do have a new federal cloud computing strategy out, right? And so we move from cloud first to cloud smart, and 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 I think it's a, an awesome document. I mean, it talks about the ideas about how security looks different in a cloud environment, you know, trust and internet connections as it was originally envisioned in a net in an enclave world was a fabulous thing, it can be a roadblock as opposed to a helper in a cloud world, this idea about data level security, the risk management concepts, there's a lot of goodness in it. And so as you think about your implementations of federal cloud computing strategy, what do you see as like your 2020 roadmap? What, what should the audience be thinking about and, and what do you think will be like the big government cloud work for the year ahead? And we'll start with you again, we'll go down. You getting your questions ready? Because we're gonna turn to you. At some point, we're going to do lightning round where everybody doesn't have to answer every question or we'll be here all day. But let's, let's since 2020 priorities are sort of like the heart of the matter for why you're all here today, let's, let's go down the row and try that again. Yeah, so start, starting in our agency, and I kind of alluded to earlier, is for us, uh, as we are finishing up our cloud migration, for us, the priority is what's next from a, what capabilities can we apply now that we're there in the cloud? Uh, and for us, it's really this big focus on artificial intelligence. And how do we apply artificial intelligence to our federal law enforcement uh, work? How do we apply artificial intelligence to our auditing work? Um, yeah, so we oversee the uh, United States Postal Service, right? Uh, just around 500,000 employees that we oversee. We're the largest, uh, one of the largest federal OIGs. Um, however, when you compare us to the agency where we oversee, we're the smallest OIG, because uh, we're only about 1,100 employees, but we oversee 500,000 employees. There is no way we can do that with manpower. It's impossible. Mm -hmm. Um, and the ways that we've been doing it in the past have been successful, but not near as successful as possible. Applying artificial intelligence to look at the massive amounts of data that Postal generates, to look for fraud, waste, and abuse, and look for theft of, uh, by employees, that's the only way that we can actually evolve our mission. So for us, 2020 is all about how do we apply artificial intelligence to leverage the limited resources we have to the greatest impact possible. Fabulous. Adam, top yeah. priorities 2020? Absolutely. You know, I think... Um, you know, when we start to think about organizations moving into the cloud, fewer in the position you're in, right? I, I think very fewer in the, we're all in the cloud, we've we finished our migration, so congratulations on being out ahead in that. Uh, but as organizations begin to look to move more and more of what they're doing into the cloud, I think really a, a pervasive quest for automation within that data center uh, in order to gain as much efficiency of operations, uh, automation of deployment, Pipelines, uh, I think that's really coming to bear, and that's a lot of what we're going to see. I think the real focus needs to be in, how do I take what I have in my data center today and automate its movement into the cloud, rather than manually moving workloads into the cloud? Having end users interact directly with your cloud providers is really, it, it seems to be the intuitive way that folks are really approaching at first, but it, it certainly doesn't scale. It doesn't go to the promise of where we want to really be uh, from a cloud perspective. So I think that automation will continue to be a huge focus, uh, especially as we start to look at a lot of the workforce impacts that are coming in to the government as well. We've got a lot of folks who are gonna be leaving, uh, and you know, it's just gonna be a, a pretty significant change in the next five years. And so the more of that we're able to automate, uh, the less of an impact that workforce attrition I think is going to have. Excellent. Tom? 
Great, uh, great question, um, and it's, uh, I see it every day as I go to work. Our CIO, Jamie Holcomb, has this giant billboard with July 2020 on it and nothing else. Um, it's all about getting ourselves high co availability, con full continuity on the cloud by July of next year. Um, like I said, we're a three billion plus dollar fee agency. Um, continuity is an important aspect. The ability for uh, folks to file and gain intellectual property rights critical to the economy. So we sit at the focal point of policy, technology, um, and innovation, and uh, co American competitiveness, right? So if, uh, if we are not enabling our organization to be the number one intellectual property office in the world, you know, we're doing ourselves a disservice. And so that really pulls itself back to our level of continuity of service, disaster recovery, time to rebuild. You know, when we've looked at these models about Boyers and the mountains, two mountain, whatever, you know, it just, we've kind of took a, took a stop and said, you know what, we're gonna do continuity of service 100% 2020. We need these tier one operations to be full continuity. So that's very, very specific. Laser light focus mention, is always good. You know? Right. I mean, I like I mentioned earlier in my early example. I mean, we already we're talking AI in there where we can. Um, you know, we're looking at blockchain. You know, as the innovation agency, um, we do like to look at innovation as it can help ourselves, yeah. not only in terms of granting the intellectual property rights on it. Excellent. How about you, Alfred? So I'm, I'm going to kind of put two of my loves together. I think you see 2020. We've adopted the cloud already. And I think in the Department of Defense, it's full in and all this stuff. But I think one of the challenges we have is the, the idea of data, data uh, sharing and data interoperability. And, mm -hmm. and I want to focus it in the cyber side of the house. I think, you know, across the Department of Defense, you have everybody focused on getting their data lakes in place, getting the data analytics pulled in so they could do the necessary evaluation of the data, to see where the potential vulnerabilities are and all that stuff. What I don't see yet is full oper operability sharing across the enterprise. You know, everybody has their environments already in place. Everyone's looking at it from their SOC perspective, but I don't see it looking, we don't, I don't see it holistically. I see the cloud as the enabler for that. So as we move, as we're, as we get more comfortable with putting capability into a cloud, including the commercial cloud and have those security boundaries around it, the more idea that everybody could share that same common data and be responsive for any potential defensive cyber operation issues that, are, that occur. Second piece in the 2020 world I think that would be interesting is and it's not a 2020 vision, it is a continuation of the challenge of addressing those legacy environments. We have lots of legacy environments out there that still need to either kind of, you know, uh, we need the, the brokering to determine, to determine what makes sense to put into the cloud, what makes sense from an from a efficiency and O&M perspective, from a cost perspective, to does it make sense to even put it in the cloud? Is it, is it a one-off solution that's not necessary? Mm -hmm. And how do you go and adopt something that can actually solve those problems? Those kind of capabilities, those kind of brokering and, and evaluations to determine what best fits into the cloud to meet the, the warfighter needs is probably the next, next well, it's a continuation of a vision that's, that's been ongoing. Perfect. And Oki, how about 2020? 2020, um, I think to change the hearts and mind of federal workforce to embrace emerging tech. RPA, blockchain, AI machine learning, deep learning, uh, recurring neural network, I think we have to, I think it's, it's a perfect time now to embrace the new technology. I mean, if you don't evolve, you become obsolete. I think the biggest part is focusing on data, but you can't focus on data when you're pushing paper around, and we do a lot of work around paper in the government. I mean, it just, it just takes forever to do anything within the government because it's paper-based. You can't analyze paper. Um, I think the, the model that we went with on Accelerate, we got, we, we put in the first blockchain network that has been ATO in the federal government. Uh, the model was the, uh, the TurboTax model. Think about the evolution of filing taxes, right? Uh, back in the 50s, 60s, you know, you do your taxes paper. It takes weeks just to get things done because you, you have to gather the information. You have to collect the information. Early 2000, you could do it online. So it'll take a couple of days. Now you do TurboTax. It, you could do it within an hour or two hours because the data is being aggregated, being moved around, being pulled in from dispersed systems, and it's being moved around through RPA. It's giving you AI. AI is giving you confidence score if you're going to get audited or not. That's the model we went with with Accelerate, and I think that could be expand for any other business in the government. It's just really the hardest part, I think, is getting away from paper. 
I think getting digitizing the digitizing the data, normalizing the data, and start analyzing and sharing the data. I think, but the start of all this of any data initiative is to get away from paper. Excellent. We would love to hear from you. Um, I'm going to suggest that since it takes a long time, to, I don't want to. I want everyone to have a chance to pile on, <laughs> but we'll do questions like jump balls, you know, and you can feel free to dive in and pick up the ball, but you, everybody doesn't have to answer every question. And I'm going to have to repeat your question because we are live on video streaming apparently. So yes, sir. Do you guys see Tick 3.0, the new um, policy uh, or design? Do you think that's going to enable in 2020? Do you think that's further out? How do you see that affecting the adoption of the cloud? Short-term, 2020, and maybe even further. So, uh, so for the sake of those watching from afar, TIC 3.0, what do you think about it, its impact on 2020 and beyond? Anybody want to jump on that one? Yeah, I mean, I, I think TIC is continuing to improve uh, in terms of security. Uh, I think the biggest part on cloud is that HSS is so large, we have so many ticks running into so many cloud environment. I think the biggest thing that we would look at is to consolidate. Start looking at some kind of master contract and picking like, hey, you know, what is the 10, 10 say, cloud offering that we will use within HSS? That, that will lessen the, the cost as, as well as security as well. Think about it, if you have your data in 100 cloud uh, providers environment, that's, that's very hard to manage. And that costs a lot to, to have a VPN or a tick to go out to all these uh, cloud uh, offering. I think consolidations and picking, you know, say 10, five, doesn't really matter. I think that's the key. I think TIC will need, uh, we'll continue to look at uh, TIC and going to three, four, doesn't really matter, but it's, it's improving cybersecurity. Excellent, thank you. Anybody else want to jump on TIC? Uh, another question from the audience. Anybody want to dive in on this? Because so far what I've done is, you know, I'm a hopeless optimist if you haven't noticed that so far, you know, so don't let my, like my enthusiasm fool you that this isn't hard work. And, uh, and you know, sometimes you bang your head a little bit and it takes a fascinating blend of patience and impatience to make progress. And so I was wondering if maybe we could ask you all to think about, is there a challenge that's first and foremost in your mind that may be hindering government agency adoption or impeding its progress that, you, that you'd like to offer up? You can have a challenge and a solution if you want, but, but what are some of the challenges that you're seeing that we ought to all focus our attention on? Well, maybe Oki, you want to take a shot? Uh, we'll come back down. Culture. This I mean, uh, it, it's it's tough to innovate and modernize in the government. Usually, the industry usually go beforehand. You know, test it out, prove prove it worked. But Jose and I, it's all you know. We're all about <laughs> jumping in first. Yeah. Uh, I think I think getting human centered design involved, user centered mm -hmm. design is key to get people to lean in and get people excited about things and you know, engage and exchange knowledge. Get them, it's marketability. When you do strategic analysis on any, you might have 100 ideas, but you may want to pursue one idea. Is it scalable, is it feasible, is it sustainable? But the most important part, is it marketable? If you can't market your ideas, it's, you, it's not gonna succeed in the government. And the biggest part is I think you could have a great innovation and then you get to the ATO process and then you're like, oh, we gotta wait a year to do it and then you lose the, the momentum. Uh, my goal, I'm, I'm a little biased in cybersecurity because my background is cybersecurity, um, I'm gonna automate the ATO. Instead of three, six months, nine months, I think I could do it within less than two weeks without skipping any process. And that's, that might be another hour of discussion. Right. So I think well, I wanna join his to... team if we can get down yeah. ATOs to two weeks, that's for sure. Yeah. Um, I think uh, the exciting thing that, or something that's a challenge, I think, is, is again, the ability to, uh, to accept risk between communities. Uh, we still have that, you know, that kind of like unfair, you know, that people still have this uh, unearthly feeling about sharing risk. And so even within the communities themselves, uh, the reciprocity of risk is still a challenge. And I think we need to break that, that barrier across, uh, especially if we're gonna start putting things in the cloud and sharing the kind of data that needs to be shared to be more efficient and more uh, uh, operationally focused. Yeah, I, I was just gonna push out that a um, couple things. Um, from a technical standpoint, you know, the, the, the great exchange that it is between government and the private sector is data, right? You pretty much give data in exchange for some government service one way or the other. Um, it's kind of the fundamental um, value proposition. But you know, for, there's a lot of challenges for organizations that in the dissemination world, 
to be able to pump out the right amount of data uh, or to even be, make that available and readily consumable in a way that's meaningful, right, to, um, to promote the useful arts, as we like to say. And so some of that's a real challenge for an agency to go, do I pay for these pipes or how do I get, how do I get this piping out? Because this isn't, it's, it costs money and it also isn't mission focused as, is, as in our delivery of, of quality and timely patents and trademarks. You know, piping things is another issue. So, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's an example of where public-private partnerships can play an interesting role um, in all of this conversation and being able to allow you know, not only just from an operational purpose and mission, the work to be done, but then wholly what are we trying to do um, as an agency to better make all agencies' data interoperable is, is making it, frankly, just available. Yeah. And we don't really do a great job of that. And we don't look at ourselves as like a collective federal cloud strategy that says, hey, we all can either work together, partner together, and play in that space. So that, for us, is a challenge. Excellent. Adam? Yeah, I think... You know, even within the CIO's organization, you see this massive amount of conflict, right? And a total lack of trust, which is unfortunate, um, because if you think about the perspective of the person on the other side, everyone's really just doing their best to deliver on the mission, right? Your ops folks, their view of the delivering on the mission is to provide a really secure operational environment that's stable and meets requirements like continuous availability. Dev folks are aligned with the business, trying to introduce new features, functionality, bring what is inherently change into that operations environment. So that has them continually at loggerheads. And then for the most part, not all of our security folks, but security folks tend to trust no one by default, right? So the CIO's organization <laughs> is just at this point of conflict. And so I think you mentioned empathy a little while ago, sort of DevOps empathy and the, the value of that and the importance of it. Bringing those small teams together uh, aligning them with the business owner uh, in that human-centered uh, design approach is vitally important to, to solving that problem and communicating what we're actually trying to do. I think the other side of it is it exposes your IT operations folks directly to the mission, and it helps them understand the true value of what they're doing. I installed a hard drive. That has no mission value, like, really. But if I help achieve this goal for my business owner, I have real mission value, right? So getting that mission value down to those operations folks is going to be key to our retention of those vital folks, dev and operations, throughout the organization. So those are the two things for me Excellent. that kind of come. And that, for me, that's cultural change, right? Okay. That's the change we're talking about. Well said. Gary, challenge? Yeah, so uh, for us, one of the biggest challenges is just uh, skill sets, right? Just keeping a educated, well-trained workforce, mm -hmm. um, especially in a very competitive environment today. Uh, it's hard to, to look at some of the salaries that some of my folks get offered and figure out, you know, I'm constrained by a pay scale that I don't get to, to adjust. I don't, I don't get to adjust that pay scale. There's only so much I can do uh, within the confines of the structure in which we operate. Uh, so trying to figure out other ways to entice them to stay with us and not go work for the Amazons when they show up, you know, and go work for these other cloud providers when they show up. That's, that's a constant, ongoing challenge. You know, I can offer telework, I can offer sense of mission, right? I drive home the, the mission that we do and, and how we're supporting, you know, what's supposed to be the most trusted uh, federal agency in the, uh, in the government, you know, the United States Postal Service. But that's an ongoing challenge is how do I retain talent and not have it just continuously walk out the door? Yeah, it, it is an amazing time. If you think about the nature of, so we go from doing it ourselves to getting it from somebody else. That requires a different set of job skills. Mm -hmm. We go from how things like robotic process automation and AI and IoT is just changing the nature of work. I mean, the workforce issues are so profound, we could do a whole other panel on that. But we, but you know, our time together has just flown by, and we're, and we're running out of time. And so we have just a few minutes left. And so I'm going to start with Gary, and I'm going to go down the row and ask each to give a piece of advice to the audience about, you know, about, let's just say this. So we're now dubbing you all lightning rods for change. So as you leave here to go be advocates for the progress that could be made in cloud and the federal government in 2020, what's a piece of parting advice that you'd like to offer the audience and uh, we'll start with Gary, or we'll work our way down to Oki, and at that time, we'll, I'll say a few last words, and we'll move you on to your next adventure for the day. Parting piece of advice to the audience. So uh, for the audience, I would say, uh, tell us, tell, from a federal perspective, tell me how you're going to be my partner, right? How are you going to work with me, uh, not just sell me something, not just walk in the door uh, for a short period of time and then leave me, right? How are we going to be in this together? How are we going to be in this to, for success? 
that's important to me to, to build that kind of relationship and understand how you're going to help me provide value added to my customers. Excellent. Yeah. For me, it's really seeking out that organizational empathy. And then as a vendor, figure out how to align yourself to the mission, to the actual business that they're trying, that your customer is trying to deliver on. Because at the end of the day, that's why whoever you're sitting across the table from, they're not there for the stellar paycheck, right? Like they, everybody's got to put food on the table. But the reality is they align themselves to the mission. That's why they're there. If you can align what you're doing to that mission, I think you'll find a lot more success in the marketplace. I, I would just say listening, you know, and listening and, and understanding the culture of an organization. And, and in my experience, one of the first questions I, I like to ask is, what type of enterprise projects do you do in your organization? And if you get an answer, either none or a lot, um, it'll tell you about the culture of an organization. And it helps you understand where, 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 where is opportunity for success. Because ultimately, what you're trying to do, like many have said, is solve a particular problem. And if that problem can be solved in a way that's well understood, focuses to the mission, speaks to all executives, and is in this sort of rinse and repeat, and that's kind of how we did the API strategy on a gateway, is once it's built once and we can replicate, that gift is a great gift, and that's the best sell I would give. Um, I'd say probably just to kind of add it to what everybody else is saying is uh, don't go in and see your mission partner or your customer and say you've solved all their problems with your, your product. <laughs> you know, you need to understand what that operational mission looks like and how you are a part of the solution. Because I guarantee you, you don't have the whole solution. Because they have, like we just heard all around, through the whole panel here, there are different components of the problem. Mm -hmm. Make sure that you understand the problem, understand the whole problem that he's trying to solve, and say, here's how I can contribute to the solution. Mm -hmm. And not say, I'm here to solve all your problems. Amen. Okay. Yeah, I agree with everyone on, on the panel. That's hit right in the head there. you got to be a solution architect. Got to figure out what the issues and align it with technology and really but you have to I think you have to embrace blockchain AI machine learning deep learning RPA I think that's that's the future I think we need to get away from paper if you could come you know to help solve that issue I think you're going to be very successful in partnering partnering up with uh, government yeah times of change are times of opportunity <laughs> And uh, as you've heard from all of our panelists up on the stage now, you know you can ride those waves of change, or you, and and they have a lot more to do with l issues around personal control, the willingness to give up personal control, and the willingness to actually take a chance on something new. And and you know if you can think through that, you'll have a lot more success. And that's why talking about a mission outcome and how you can improve a mission outcome is always better than talking about about the, you know, the widget that you're trying to deliver. And uh, as Simon Sinek said, you know, his book, Start With Why, and the what's and how's will follow. So have a plan, move with speed. IT modernization issues always work better when they stay ahead of the pace of technology change. Involve the customer throughout. Relentlessly communicate so you can adjust course and celebrate your successes, and it will be easy. Well, no, but it will make an important difference. Would you join me in thanking our wonderful panelists for spending time with you today? <laughs>